Hey everybody, welcome. Um, this is going to be our last set of videos and our last topic on the search for extraterrestrial intelligence and intelligent life. Um, here is your quick quiz to remind you what we talked about last time. We talked about habitable planets, exoplanets. What should they be like? Um, so take a look at that, write down your answer, and find it on Moodle. All right, so today we get to talk about the search not just for life not just microbes or plants or anything like that but the search for intelligent life and i'm going to start here ooh, hello pen i'm going to start here by talking about ways that we have tried to contact life um, so what are some ways some messages that we have sent hoping that somebody out there is listening. So in the 1970s, we first began to have the technology to send ooh, spacecraft out um, well beyond Earth. And so this was a time when we actually sent quite a few messages hoping that somebody was listening, um, that somebody could find them and interpret them. So we're going to look at three examples. Uh, the first one came from the Pioneer spacecraft. So the Pioneer spacecraft were launched in the 70s. Um, they were called Pioneer 10 and Pioneer 11. And they both carried a plaque. So the spacecraft, the Pioneer 10 and 11 spacecraft, both carry a plaque and they still have the plaque they are way way out there in space but they are carrying this plaque and it shows a little bit about us um, depicting humanity okay so let me write that down then i'll show you here the plaque oh and yeah this was in the 19 70s. Actually, all the examples we're going to look at are from the 1970s. So here's what the spacecraft looked like. We knew we were going to send it out through the solar system, past several planets, um, and eventually it would leave the solar system. And so um, scientists decided to attach this plaque to it. And it has some interesting information. Um, it had the humans, hello the silhouettes of our intelligent life. Um, in the background, it had a silhouette of what the spacecraft looked like with its, with its antenna. It showed where the spacecraft was going to go, that it was going to fly by, it was going to leave Earth um, and fly by Mars and Jupiter and Saturn, um, showing all our planets. And here is actually our galaxy and our the position of our um, ourself compared to these pulsars, which are really bright um, pulsing stars. We talked about pulsars, remember when we talked about neutron stars? And then it also had a little bit about hydrogen. So just some information that we thought that we could share that somebody might be able to interpret. And while I'm here, look, this looks like kind of a fuzzy grainy picture of Jupiter, but it was really the first up close picture of the planet. We had never seen it like that before. Um, so Pioneer, uh, they really were true pioneers, um, not just looking for life, but in sending amazing images back um, to us in the 1970s. The next spacecraft that went up, they had similar missions. They were planet explorers. Um, these were the Voyager spacecrafts, again, launched in the 1970s a little later. Um, and there were, again, two of them. The two Voyager spacecraft, they actually carried um, a record. So two Voyager spacecraft, um, and they were sent to, to take pictures of the outer planets and such, um, but they not just carried a plaque, but a record, a phonograph, not vinyl. Um, it was actually golden uh, with a gold, oops, graph, which I can't spell here. Um, a golden record with a gold coating so it would hold up well in space. They carry phonograph records of all kinds.
kinds of interesting things from Earth. Sounds, uh, greetings in different languages. I'm going to play you a couple of these sounds. Music, all different kinds of music created by the humans of Earth. Um, other messages, they had some of the similar engravings that we saw on the, the pioneer um, thing and animal sounds. And so yes, an alien life may not have a record player, <laughs> but it was the height of technology um, at the time. So I sent this record up and here, here's the cover of the record that has some of those etchings. Um, here are those pulsars, that hydrogen atom, some other information um, that we thought that intelligent life might be able um, to interpret. But let's, let's think about the record for a minute. So you can go to the Voyager website, and one cool thing about Voyager is it's now at the edge of our solar system. Look here, it is so many miles um, from Earth, over 150 times the distance between Earth and the Sun. It would take 20 light hours to reach it. So it's beyond the edge of our solar system now, and it still carries with it this golden record. So you can get an up-close view here of the golden record and sort of what it contains. Um, here's how it was made and all of this. But let's listen to a couple of sounds. Um, some of the sounds, well here, let me click on this first. Um, some of the sounds were greetings in 55 different languages. I'm going to play you this um, one Amoy from the Chinese dialect because I love what it says. So you can read the translation there. It says, Friends of Space, how are you all? Have you eaten yet? Come visit us if you have time. And I just love that. Um, people had all different kinds of messages, and you can read them there, but that was just one of my favorite ones. Um, they also had all different kinds of sounds. We talked about music. There's some images on there. Um, under the sounds, I picked this one for us to listen to. So they have a lot of human um, sounds, um, animal sounds, all kinds of interesting things, um, earth sounds that you can listen to there. So that's kind of a cool thing um, that we sent out there to the stars. Um, so I wanted to share that with y'all. So that was Pioneer, <clears throat> sent the plaque. Voyager went a step further and sent some sounds and images. And then we also, in the 1970s, sent a radio message. So this is a radio message that came, <clears throat> that was sent by the Arecibo Radio Telescope. This, at the time, was the biggest radio telescope in the world. Now there's one that's a little bit bigger in China. Um, it's so big, it's built into the side of hills. Um, it doesn't even move, telescope. So the Arecibo Radio Telescope beamed out a radio message to the stars, specifically to a cluster um, of stars, a place where we know that there's a whole bunch of stars very close together. This star cluster is called M13. That's just the name of it. You can find it in the night sky. This was in 1974. And so this was a pretty interesting message. Let me show you a picture of the telescope. Here it is. Um, Arecibo is in, um, sorry, I just totally lost the name of where it is. <laughs> if I remember, I'll get back to you. One of those islands. Anyway, sorry. Um, but it sent out this message. And it contained numbers, and this was all in binary. So this is a pictorial representation of what it looked like. But it was actually all these 
colored dots would be ones and the black spaces would be zeros. So we sent out this binary message. It had numbers one to ten. Look at this. You should notice here something familiar. We talked about those elements that make up most of life on Earth. Here they are. Right There's five of the six um, that we talked about. Here are some of those molecules, especially some of those carbon-based molecules, the chemistry of life. Here's our DNA. Right Here's that human shape again, like the plaque, the solar system, um, and what the observatory looks like, and sort of its uh, scale um, and its size. So this was really, really cool um, message, but, okay, we sent it to this star cluster, M13. M13 is 50,000 light years away. That's right. So we sent this in 1974. It's barely gone anywhere. Uh, it has not reached these particular stars yet. Um, so it will take time for the message to get there and time for the message to get back. But now we're thinking about sending a new message. Um, so scientists are ready to do this again and, and send more messages out to the stars. We don't just send messages though. We actually listen as well. And so that's another piece of this search for intelligent life is seeing if anybody else is doing um, what we did with Arecibo in 1974. And the main people doing this listening, sorry, listening for life, the main people doing it are the SETI Institute, the Search for Extraterrestrial in Intelligence, S-E-T. I, um, <clears throat> and they have a set of telescopes called the Allen Telescope Array. And the Allen Telescope Array spends a lot of time listening. Um, it spends time looking at other <clears throat> astronomical objects as well. There's some pictures of the telescopes. <clears throat> Excuse me. It is located in California. And it is listening for radio signals. It's another type of radio telescope. Instead of being one big radio telescope like Arecibo, this is a bunch of small ones that we can link together and listen for radio signals. So how can they tell that the radio signals are from intelligent life? Well, they're looking for patterns, um, essentially. Uh, they things that seem unnatural. A lot of things like pulsars do put out very regular um, pulses, but looking for something different uh, than that. SETI is another one of these that we talked about with the exoplanets where you can get involved at home. Your computer can actually analyze some of the signals from these telescopes looking um, for patterns. Um, there's kind of, there's sort of an old uh, fiction book now in a really old movie called Contact uh, that talks about the lady, a lady named Jill Tarter. She's fictional in the book, but there's a lady in real life um, who began this search. And so I recommend Contact. It's a cool book that's based um, on her life. So that is a little bit about what we do to search for extraterrestrial life. Um, we send messages, we listen, all that good stuff. So I'm going to leave it there. And then our last video will be about what are the chances that there's actually life out there.